Lymphoma Hub Podcasts, brought to you by Scientific Education Support. The following podcast is a recording of the Lymphoma Hub Steering Committee discussing autologous stem cell transplantation in DLBCL. Is it over? The chair is Gil Sells, and he is joined by Michael Dickinson, Andrew Davies, Catherine Thiebelmunt, Ulrich Jaeger, Astrid Pavlovsky, Judith Trotman, and Gregor Novakovsky. I think everybody has heard the data that were presented at ASH, uh, uh, the data of uh, uh, Zuma 7, uh, uh, comparing the use of uh, uh, AXI cell uh, 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 immediately after relapse versus salvage plus transplant, the data of Belinda, uh, which uh, compares salvage uh, followed by transplant versus uh, bridging tisagen leclerc cell uh, uh, followed uh, antisagen leclerc cell and the data of uh, uh, TRANSFORM, who evaluated in this setting uh, 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 a lethal cell with an optional uh, 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 bridging. Um, I think there have been an excellent uh, review paper in blood by uh, uh, Jason Westin and uh, 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 Laurie Sen uh, just a few days ago, uh, 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 reporting the summary of, of this data. And I think, uh, there are a couple of uh, 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 insights. Um, as we know, the uh, result of these patients that were selected based on uh, either being refractory and in the three trial, I think 60 to 70% of the patient were indeed refractory um, and, and or having a relapse within 12 months after completing therapy uh, uh, was better in two trials compared to SCT and uh, uh, Belinda didn't show difference. So the question is, uh, do you feel based on these results that you should uh, uh, change your strategy or all strategies that was established 30 years ago? Uh, um, I mean, obviously it depends on the approval of this product, which may differ country by country. Are there some subcategories of patients that you feel uh, are not necessarily part of this trial or not well explored in this trial? that may still benefit from classical management. These are probably the, the, the question, and uh, I think um, we can go that on a, on a bond table. I don't know who wants to start. I'll kick off. I'll give it a go. So, um, look, I think, uh, I think um, for most of us, when we look at using CAR-T in, you know, at the proposal of using it in the majority of patients, you know, we know the majority of patients do relapse early if they're going to relapse. Um, so that they would fit the eligibility criteria for Zuma 7 in many cases. And uh, the immediate sort of panic is um, the feasibility of applying uh, CAR-T in routine practice. And I think I realise that's going to vary by region. But putting that aside, the Zuma 7 data are very compelling. You know, this the, the uh, endpoints are fairly clear cut. The statistics are very good and um, there does appear to well, there is clearly um, a favourable outcome both for EFS and PFS in the experimental arm. Um, uh, one of the problems with these trials when you put them all together is that, um, I mean, of course, we haven't yet seen the nitty gritty with the lysosel trial, but it, it is, is that for most centres, when these patients present with their relapsed disease, you have to start treatment straight away. And uh, Zuma 7 doesn't really explore that scenario exactly. Um, so that raises the possibility that those patients weren't uh, evaluated um, uh, thoroughly by that trial, I suppose, in the minds of some people. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if, uh, if a patient who started on salvage can access CAR-T or not. And I don't know, uh, you know how that's being approached uh, where the approvals uh, already exist. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to chip in. Um, you know, of course, this is a subset of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. You know, these patients are um, all within 12 months of completion of therapy. So, of course, we, you know, we see late relapses in uh, DLBCL. So I, the question about is it all over for the ASCT and the answer to that is, is no. I do, I do think, as Michael says, it brings on some really interesting questions. Those patients who were in Zuma 7 um, didn't have um, concerns about organ compromise they didn't receive any um, bridging therapy and 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 so for the dynamic of that disease is is interesting and perhaps not always reflective 
of prime, you know, many patients with primary refractory disease that we do see. So I, I guess it's going to be interesting to know what we're going to do with patients who do need to have um, some bridging therapy, particularly for us in Europe, where the timelines at the moment for CAR T cells are behind that of North America. And what do we do with those patients who have an excellent response to bridging therapy? Do we still go on to give the CAR or do we think that there may still be a role for this stem cell transplant in that group of patients? So I think it, it, there's some really interesting questions to, you know, to, be, to be answered. So it, clearly the data from Zoom 7 is very compelling. Um, and, and although we don't see an overall survival advantage yet, there looks like those curves are going to separate. And obviously, there's the impact of the third line therapies that patients had subsequently. But um, I think I think the data is, you know, is really very exciting. But there's still a role for ASCT and DLBCL. I would uh, answer uh, yes, <laughs> it is over. <laughs> Because even for late relapse, um, we will uh, have the choice of uh, bispecific soon in second line, I guess, or bispecific plus chemotherapy. And uh, then uh, we'll not have uh, the need to high dose therapy plus autologous stem cell transplantation. And then for the patients that are really refractory, relapsing um, very early after ARCHOP or first line therapy, we would like, I think, in the near future to use uh, immunotherapy and not high-dose chemotherapy. So for me, yes, so I answer yes, for sure. Catherine, I'm going to feel constrained by <laughs> by what we can and can't do, and so I still think there is a there's going to be a role because I know that my funders um, are going to say, you know, patients up until you know 12 months at, at that 12 month cutoff, then you're going to have to go back to the conventional way. So I still think that we'll be doing this for a little while, and I think that's quite a lot for the biospecifics to prove in this setting yet, in terms of durability of response. We'll see that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I would agree with uh, Catherine, um, but we may need another randomized trial between the bispecifics <laughs> and the cars. <laughs> uh, there, there's, there's another question, and that's the extrapolation of the uh, ASCT data uh, to the non transplant eligible patients. I mean, uh, we hear rumors that that may be in the label of some of the products without having had a trial in second line. So do you have an opinion on that? I mean, there's, a, there's, you know, in, in Zoom 7, the, um, the subgroup was, there was a subgroup analysis uh, for the older patients within the main paper, you could see the, the multiple subgroup analysis. And, you know, um, there was no suggestion that that subgroup uh, did worse, um, uh, at, least, at least in what's been presented so far. Um, so that's, you know, pretty convincing. But of course, we know that the patients who went into Zuma 7 were perceived by uh, as being transplant eligible, um, only a small proportion of patients fell off or came off voluntarily very early, having been randomised to the standard of care arm. Um, so there's maybe some people who who went on hoping to be randomised to the experimental arm and then, uh, you know, came off because they didn't want to go through the transplant. But it, there's still a relatively older population in Zuma 7. So, uh, you know, it suggests that if CAR T is tolerable, you're going to get good outcomes. And I don't know um, any treatment that reaches that that bar that that was achieved um, by the experimental arm uh, in Zuma Seven. So I, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, I can I can I can understand the the reason why um, the label is being considered to be extended beyond that population. Although I don't know how these decisions are made. I, I think there are some data with lysocell in second line patients. So I think this was part of the uh, uh, phase two studies where there was a population mm -hmm. of uh, patients in second line. I think there are also ongoing trials in these populations. So for non transplant eligible patients going forward. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's here. 
Um, I, I agree a little bit with the word of caution regarding the durability of response with other things. I mean, ICT is curative uh, in a number of patients in late relapse. So before we throw it away, we, we have to be a little bit more sustained result of uh, uh, the bispecific. And Mike, I know you will present additional results at ASCO, but I haven't seen them. And I, I doubt we'll be with five years result because this is not the case yet. Um, I, I would like also to, to, to jump with, with some categories of, of large cell lymphoma that were not necessarily well explored. Uh, we had a discussion in our group recently with a patient with primary mediastinal. These patients were not in Zuma 7, and we do know that they respond to salvage and to transplant. Uh, there is also some other entity, T cell, uh, uh, histocyte reach, or, or others. So I think we, we, we tend to generalize. But I think we have maybe a word of caution here for some of these entities that were either not represented, underrepresented. And um, well, I, I believe that most of the patient will have to will go to CAR T, and I will rather advocate for CAR T. Alison knows that, but I think uh, it's true that the data, if we look even in transforms, there were like I think seven or nine patients with primary mediastinal, so that's not a lot. And um, I think we have to be a little bit careful when we move fast from treatments that are established in 30 years. But Gilles, I would say to that, that we know that patients with primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma probably respond less well to reinduction therapies. And we've seen that from some historical data. Uh, and we've seen in third line setting small numbers of patients with primary mediastinal lymphoma who have done very well with CAR T. So I think it's not unreasonable to extrapolate that. I understand your, your caution, but I, I think it's not unreasonable to extrapolate that into the second line. Personally, I agree, but I think we, we miss data. Let's put it yeah. like that. And I think the data regarding salvage in this setting may be uh, 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 different. Any other opinion uh, uh, to keep us on time about this topic? I think it would be nice to see some real-world evidence of, this, of the results from SCART in second line, to see if the institutions have a learning curve or, you know, if we can all do all reproduce this stuff. Well, wasn't there that recent publication, you know, in terms of real world evidence, you know, with all its flaws, um, the retrospective review from CIBMTR um, recently in blood, uh, where the overall survival advantage was with auto, but of course it's, you know, a real hot potch of uh, patients. So I'm not quite ready to throw auto out the window yet for the long, late relapses, particularly in those who can tolerate it. But, you know, this uh, early CAR T cell is a pipe dream for us, isn't it, Michael? <laughs> I think it's a while away in our region uh, from a you know, practical sense, but um, we can work towards it and hope. I guess the other thing we need to just remember is about the aftercare from CAR T's and the burden that also, you know, has in terms of patients with ongoing cytopenias that may last some some time, the ongoing B cell aplasia with the immunoglobulins and the antibiotics and all the all the rest of it. So I I do think we just need to remember it's not a simple one-off um, hospital stay and then you recover. There's a lot of things to think about with the ongoing care of these of these patients. So I think we need to always take that into consideration when we're thinking about the logistics operationally and the economics of CAR T. And, uh, and the other thing I'd say is I don't think we're ready to lay down our guns or, you know, um, CAR-T looks better in this randomised trial, but, you know, there's still a very large proportion of patients who weren't cured and um, we want to do better, right, the, the, in, in this population. And it's still overall a bit disappointing that we, that, that we didn't see higher CR rates um, overall and the the thing that I'm mulling over in my mind is, is what to do about that. And, and uh, is our new control arm um, AxiCell or, or, or maybe Lysacell for everything? And how's that going to work? How are, we, how are we going to improve upon these outcomes? Because they need to be improved upon. And it needs to be substantially cheaper. <laughs> we, we can't spend this sort of money on something that, you know, only 30% of people are alive two years later. 
you know, that's a lot of rituximab and obinutuzumab I could buy for, for patients. But, but I agree with what Michael said. There is this gap in efficacy which we need to improve on. And um, for me, it was particularly I don't know, disappointing, but actually surprising that there was the response rate in the second line was not higher than what we had seen in the third line, right? Uh, the bar has not moved much uh, up despite moving to the uh, to the second line. Uh, mm -hmm. But but Greg, the population was a bit different. I mean, let's yeah. not, let's not forget that. I agree. Um, so so <laughs> yeah. Greg, do you think that there is options also for uh, or other immunologically based approach in patients that are not transplant uh, uh, eligible? You presented uh, 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 some data regarding the comparison of uh, um, Tafalen versus uh, CAR T in a handful of patients. Uh, 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 there were not apparent differences in these results. Uh, that's correct. Um, those patients were much to um, Elmine study, um, as um, you're aware. So that's a little bit different population, but in a, those closely matched uh, patients to Elmine like population, there was no uh, difference in a small cohort of patients. Uh, so that's more of an exploratory hypothesis generating uh, study. Uh, but those approaches look very interesting. Um, I think if you add to it the uh, possibility of bispecifics um, added to either imits or even imits with tafacitumab or other combinations, um, I think there is a huge potential that those combinations could actually uh, uh, move uh, uh, forward quite rapidly. Uh, um, I think the durability of responses by specific keeps getting better and we'll hopefully see it soon as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the nice thing about bispecifics in contrast to CAR T cells, uh, they can be actually combined fairly easily uh, with, uh, uh, with different uh, backbones. Um, and one of those would be a tafasumab and lalidomide, uh, but you can imagine many other uh, immunological backbones that by specifics could be added to. Thank you for listening to the Lymphoma Hub podcast. We would also like to thank our supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Insight, Pharmacyclics, Roche, Novartis, AstraZeneca, and Beijing. Lymphoma Hub podcasts brought to you by Scientific Education Support.